word of the Lord as we, as we celebrate today as family day. We want to speak to the church family. And I want us to turn together to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 from the New King James Version of the Bible. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. Hallelujah. And it says, Therefore, as you have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Therefore, as you have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are of the household of faith. And I want to read this from the New International Version of the Bible because this word household also means family. The NIV puts it this way, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. The family of believers. The church is a family of believers, a family of saints. Because we have been all washed in the blood of Jesus. We all claim God as our father. And if he's our father, then we are a family. You got what I'm saying? The person who sits beside you, as long as they're saved, they're your brother and sister or sister. All right? Take a look at the person beside you. If you're saved, say to them, we's family. Good. So we are family. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God or members of the family of God. So we are part of a family. The word household in the Greek means an immediate family or a blood family, a family by blood. So through salvation, we've been brought into the family of God. So we are a community of saints, a family that's saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the question is, the thing is, we are family, saved, and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's established. We are a family. But the question I want to ask us today, recognizing that this community is a family, my question to you, are we a loving family? You can be a family, but are we a loving family? Because if you, if you read the Word of God, you will begin to see the demands that God places upon us as a family to be loving and caring and to be reaching out to each other and looking after the interests of each other. So it's not so much to be a family, but are we loving? Because that's the thing that makes the difference. You see, we may have good services with the presence and the power of God. And people may be talking about us saying that, that we're different, our services are different. And people may be joining this ministry. But the question I have to ask is this. With all that is happening in our midst, are we really behaving like a family? Do we really love each other as the Bible says? Do we know each other? Are we sacrificing for each other and bearing with one another? So as I take a critical look at new dimensions and I measure it up against the word of God, to me, this is this especially 
one thing we need to work on and we need to push to make it happen and that is being a loving and caring family of believers God's desire for us is that anyone coming into this body of believers this community of saints this gathering will be blown away by the love and care we have one for another not just by the miracles, not just by the presence of God, but by the demonstration of love. Because love is something that has to be demonstrated. Love is not abstract. It is demonstrated in kind deeds. So after I read the word and I search the scriptures, I have to say to myself, if we cannot be a loving and caring family, then we shouldn't be a church. If we cannot love one another, care for one another, look out for one another, then we cannot function as a church. Ouch. You see, what God wants among us, what the Spirit of God wants among us, is that we function truly as God's people. Because if we don't function in love, it makes the church ugly. And where people would come in, they will look, and very soon they will leave. And you, and you don't want people to say, is this all Christianity has to offer? Now, I'm not saying we are bickering and we are pulling at one another. I'm not saying that we are uh, attacking one another. But I believe that there needs to be a sharpening of our love and the demonstration of that love. And the church needs to be the body of people where people come in and look and say, yes. We don't want to be the kind of people where people come in and see us and say, now nah, that's not what the church should be about. I can get it better among the Muslims. I can go and join a cult. They'll love me better. No, the church has to be the people that show true love the church must be known for its love not just its miracles in fact Jesus said in John chapter 13 and verse 35 by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another and that term, that word love in the Greek is agape or agape. It means the God kind of love, not a fleeting love. Not liking you when you're good to me and not liking you when you say something bad to me. But it's a love that never dies. The world will know that we're his disciples. It's interesting that Jesus didn't say the world will know that we're disciples by the miracles we do. He didn't say they'll know that we're disciples if the church grows fast. That the world will know that we are truly disciples if we have love. And if that love is demonstrated. My prayer for new dimensions is that we will have a deep love one for another. And that love will be demonstrated in many practical ways. Like the early church. Where people demonstrated the God kind of love. And there was no needy person in the church. And the saints felt cared for. This is the kind of church I want to see. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, as I read earlier, it says, Therefore, as you have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially, or more so, to those who belong to the family of believers. So we're to do good, but more so I'm to do good to you. Because you're my family. I can bless others out there, but you, I bless more because we are family. You get what I'm saying? We can treat people good out there, but in here we got to treat them. We got to move it to yet another level. Because we are family. So today I want to talk about the church, a loving family. What this family should look like. What a loving church should look like. 
And this relates primarily to the church, but I believe this can be extended in your natural family, what we should look like. First of all, Romans chapter 12 and verse 9 to 13. So look at a few scriptures and make a few comments on them and we'll be practical today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 13. Love, and I'm reading from the NIV, New International Version. If that's not your version, you can follow on the board, on the, on the screen, thank you. Love must be sincere, not hypocritical. Must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Wow. Never lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. So I want to pull some things out of here. First, it says, a family loves sincerely. Love must not be hypocritical. We must not say, I love you, but then behind your back, we're talking about you. We must not, in fact, it, it must be understood that if we're part of a family of believers, that we love one another. Let me go a step further. There should be nothing called hate in our mouths or in our lives except towards sin. Nothing should come out of our mouths like, I hate how she's walking church. No, 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 no. No, that kind of thing. Love should be sincere. In John chapter 15 and verse 9 to 10 and then verse 12, it says this. Jesus said, as the Father have loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. So immediately, we begin to see that the level of our love must be raised. Because we must love one another as Christ has loved us. On that level. Wow. We must love. And that love must be sincere. And I'm not going to stress on all these points. I'm going to just let the Holy Spirit work them into your spirit. Secondly, out of this, a loving family must show affection to each other. And remember... Love must be pure. When the Bible speaks of affection, it's not talking about anything sensual. It's talking about pure love. So we must demonstrate affection. Christians should not be cold and standoffish with one another. It is okay to come into the service... And we see someone, we haven't seen them all week. How was your week? God bless you. And there's nothing wrong with, how was you? I bless you. I hope everything goes well with you. What we're doing is showing kind affection to one another. That's what a family is like. Let me move on. Coming out of this verse, these verses, a family honors each other. A family honors one another above themselves. Now this is where we're taking love to another limit. In other words, we give preference to one another. We give high respect to each other. So we consider each other as more worthy than ourselves. Oh my goodness. Oh Jesus, help me. We understand I am worthy. But you're more worthy than I am. God blesses me, but you're worthy to get more blessings than I do. 
That's how we should be. We should be looking at one another and treating one another. And don't say that can't happen. Because the word of God tells us to do it. So if we don't, or if we can't, ask Holy Spirit to help you. Oh God, help me to love like this. Where we, where we recognize the value of each other. And we value one another highly. And we honor each other above ourselves. Then it also says a family shares with one another. We're glad to help those who are in need. I like what James said. James, let's bring up James. Um, I like what, what it says in the book of James. James chapter 2, and um, verse 14, yeah, and 15. Just a moment. Here, here we go. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be, and be, and be and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? A family shares. If we know someone is in need and we can do something about it, we don't say, oh, go and tell the church. Go and tell the pastor. Because sometimes that's the habit of people. Tell the pastor they're there for that. No, we're, there, we're here for one another. If I can do something about your situation to help you, and you tell me about your need, I am duty-bound to bless you and help you. And not say, let the pastor know. But a family that's a loving family serves one another, and they bless one another, and they share with one another. What about John? First epistle of John chapter 3 in verse 17 to 18. John puts it this way. If, and I'm reading from the NIV. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. Amen. One of the key elements about the early church was their sharing with one another. Those who were in need were taken care of by the saints because the saints gave to the, to the needs. However, let me put in here. However, in sharing, I want us also to pray for wisdom. That part has to go in. Because there are people that love to take. So as much as we share, wisdom must come about. You get what I'm saying? Because we don't, we don't want to be tricked by anyone who always wants to take from people and don't work. In, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, in the NIV it says, Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these shall learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. For this is pleasing to God. The widow who is really in need and left all alone puts her hope in God and continues night and day to pray and ask God for help. Now here's the principle. If someone is in need, we will want to help them. But also the Bible says 
if you, if you understand what, what Paul is saying to Timothy, you also investigate. And if the people, if the person has family or relatives, then you implore the relatives to help. Not that you don't want to help, but you always want to allow the family to bless one another, the natural family. So, so you gotta, you got to strike the balance, all right? Yes, help will come. But what about your immediate family? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 to 12. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, but they're busy bodies. Such people are commanded and urged in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. So as much as Paul says we shear and we give, we must also help those who don't want to work but love to receive also to make for themselves so they can bless someone in need. Amen? So loving family shares. We want to bless one another. We want to help those that are in need. Also, a loving family practices hospitality. That term, that term hospitality means to be warm and friendly towards others. To be welcoming and generous. Here's a good word, to be sociable. And to care for one another. Practicing hospitality. What am I saying today? That the scriptures are even commanding us to go beyond our natural uh, personality. There are people who say, well, I'm not sociable. I don't like mixing with people and all of that. But that's you. But the word is calling upon us now to move beyond you. And be hospitable. Because God doesn't want you to stay at being you. God wants you to be like Christ. So we must not become comfortable in who we are. You get what I'm saying? Well, I don't like mixing with people. I don't, I don't want getting involved with anybody. Nobody coming to my home. I just want to come to church and leave. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You've got to move beyond that. Because there's a greater call upon your life to be hospitable to one another. And to be caring for one another. And a simple thing, how was your week? Now, my wife will tell you, by, by, by personality, I am not that sociable. I'm talking about, so I, I can give a perfect example. But I have to move beyond me. Sometimes I tell God, I think God, you've made a mistake. Because naturally, and i got to understand that I can't go by what's natural. I have to go by what's supernatural. Naturally, naturally I'm not prone to be sociable. Naturally I'm not prone to crowds. I don't like crowds. Well, naturally I'm a loner. That's naturally. But what does the Bible say? I have to move from beyond me. To what the word of God says. If I am to live a successful Christian life. So sometimes my wife has to be pushing and prodding me to get out the house. I can stay in my house for a whole year and not have a worry. But then, but then I have a wife that's sociable. So God gave her me to get me out of me. But I cannot live according to how I am because how I am is not the complete man. The complete man is in Christ. So I have to love people. I have to touch people. I have to be hospitable to people. I have to be sociable when I don't want to be and say, God, help me. I feel like disappearing right now, but God, just anoint me to be sociable. And God does it. Do you know there's an anointing to be sociable? Pray for it, it works. So we've got to be hospitable to one another, kind and caring to each other. That's what I call demonstrations of love. 
in 1 Peter chapter 4, and uh, from verse 7 to 9, it says, But the end of all these things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will conquer a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. And I like, I like, I like Peter, he put that in there. Without grumbling. So we say to each other, oh, go around and just bless one another and tell, wish them a blessed day. Go and embrace someone or, and bless one another. And immediately, we see people sitting down. Not me, I need for that, I ain't turning on, so. Or if we say, no, don't sit down, come, get up. Even if you got to go to the back, don't wait for anyone to come to you. You might do it, but then there's a grumbling. Oh, you know, I don't like doing this. Good morning. But be hospitable without, be, be hospitable without grumbling. So you tell me, apostle, that you don't like crowds and you're not sociable. I say, yes, I am. Because I don't go according to my natural. So you being an apostle, you, you, you pretend? No. I move from outside of myself to function according to how Christ wants me to function. And it works. You got what I'm saying? So it's no issue. Bless you, Sonia. And to touch people and to care for one another. That's how God wants us to be. Yes. Come out of you and get into Christ. It's, it's, it's easy because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So if you don't like the, the embracing and the hugging, go on and embrace a brother in the name of Jesus. She didn't want to tell me I'll do that. I even feel like doing that. God bless you, Troy. God bless you, Troy. And when we, we do a little... Uh, God bless you. God bless you. But you're going to stand up, you know. Let go of your wife, good. God bless you. And we move on. And we don't want to do it, but we got to pull ourselves out of us. And say, God, your word says to do it. So we'll do it. Against me and against my grain, I'm going to obey your word. When you do that, boy, all heaven is released to you. So you can accomplish anything you want to accomplish. Also, being hospitable means that it's okay to invite brothers and sisters to your home for fellowship. Amen. I want a body at my home because I want a body to come and see why God, because why God is mine. My home just for me and my family. My chairs don't look good. My floor don't look good. My curtains don't look good. But being hospitable, it go beyond what your home look like. This is my castle. I don't care what you think about it. I mean, growing, growing up in church on Sundays, I came in our house. I grew up in a home where my door was always open. I, you understand what I'm saying? People come and don't call and say, I come in first. They just turn up. We didn't have much to eat, but my mother stretched it. And you, there were, there were, there were six of us plus our parents, but sometimes you can get 15 people in our home. And the food stretched. Because there was always a welcome. And people coming by you and all of that. And I never once heard my parents say, but they're always coming. They know we want time for ourselves. It was like, come in, come in. I grew up in that kind of atmosphere. It's always welcome. Can you come to lunch with me on Sunday? No matter if you cook good or not, that's your food. All right, we don't want to go there. Let me move on. If you can't cook good, take them to Shafat. Secondly, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. 
Let me pull out some more points from here. It says, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. See, it comes again. Honoring one another above yourselves. Wow. Esteem each other above themselves. Let each of you look not just to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. There's a loving church family must be like-minded. We must have the same mind. Where it relates to the things of God like-minded. There must be agreement with the things we're doing even though you don't understand. We must have, we must have an agreement where we, to the vision of the church and the things that we are, we are seeking to accomplish. There must be agreement even to the things that the Spirit of God wants to do. We must be like-minded. I'll talk more about that later. A loving family, and, and it comes out of being like-minded, so we function in one accord. Because when we're like-minded, then we function in unity. We function in harmony. We have a unity of purpose. I believe with all my heart, if the church can be united, I'm talking about a local um, ministry. If a community of saints can be united, the Spirit of God will break out and break forth in this place like never before. I don't understand everything God does. And God does not have the right to explain to me everything he does. We have to trust God. And not so much for the speaking in tongues kind of thing. But that's new dimensions. So we get on board. And not so much for the song of the Lord. I know apostle and, and prophet and pastor and the elders are talking about song of the Lord. I don't know what this song of the Lord new thing that they're talking about. But we get on board. We're like-minded. Because if the word says, we see it in the word, we, we, we teach the word, we may not understand everything, but there is an agreement. Trust me, there are things that God does I do not understand. But I will never say, see that? I want none of that. Because what I'm beginning to, to say is, God, I don't want none of you. So there must be an agreement. There must be an understanding. One thing about the early church, the Bible says about them, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. It didn't say... They continue in the doctrine of the word. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. So what the apostles taught, they embraced, and together they moved in the same direction. There was oneness. There was harmony. They were united together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, an interesting thing happened. Interesting thing. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, the disciples were with one accord in one place. And when that unity came, something happened from heaven. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I believe if God can get us functioning in accord, there's some suddenlies that will burst forth from heaven. You talk about living according to heaven. Some of the very things that we've been praying for to be unleashed in this place will happen easily when the church functions in one accord. So we, if we don't understand prophecy, we should never say, well, this thing about prophecy, that is new dimensions. That's our vision. That's our culture. So we agree. See, agreement don't mean you understand everything. 
It simply means you trust the leaders. Right? I believe I know all my heart when we function in unity, we can achieve anything. I want to use a negative thing to uh, convey a very powerful and positive thing. In Genesis chapter 11, something negative happened, but God, God saw the power of it. And I want to turn it into the positive. Genesis chapter 17. So it's Genesis 11, I'm sorry, uh, from verse 1 to 7. Now the whole world had, had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They use bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. <clears throat> then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tar that reaches to the heavens. And so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. And here's God's coming. And the Lord said, If as one people, speaking one language, they began to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. You hear God saying this? This was not a man making an observation. This was God looking at what these people with their evil intent was doing. And he said, if as one people saying the same thing, that they can do this, then nothing that they plan will be impossible for them. And God says, and it was because of the evil heart, God says, come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. You see, the devil, the devil has taken an example from what God did and is using it against the church. If we become one people, saying the same thing, I want you to hear me. It's not when when you get outside the church and you find somebody and you look at them and say, you see, see how they sound Lord and prophetic, Adrian? I don't know what this guy's doing, but I'm with that. What about you? Your response will be? <laughs> <laughs> Your response will be, but we are for it. Your response will be, yeah, you know. Because people always look for people who are on their side. But you've got to bring people back in line. It won't be, yeah, I don't understand that. We've got to say the same thing. Because if we become one and we're saying the same thing and we're functioning together, nothing will be impossible for us. But what the devil has done and successfully is come among the church and confuse what? Our language. It's not that it's not that he causes you to speak Spanish and you French, not like God did, but he confuses our language so that you don't agree, so you speak it to her and you speak a different thing from what is being taught. And then over here, you get something else happening and we're saying something different. And the enemy steps back and says, well, nothing shall be accomplished there. He is using the very same thing to confuse our language. And we allow our opinions to rule instead of what God said. And we allow our feelings to have preeminence instead of the word of God. And we find ourselves saying different things. But we belong to one body. Can you imagine if one of my, one of my feet decided and said to my hands, I'm not moving today. I'm not walking properly today. 
And my hand said, I'm not functioning today. I'll just sleep. Can you imagine how it will walk? Because the body is rebelling. But when I want to move, there is harmony in the body so that the brain receives the message from the foot we want to move. And in a microsecond, there's a release. And the entire body goes together. That's harmony. Each is doing a different task, but moving in the same direction. There's a difference between harmony or unity and unison. Unison and unity is different. See, in, in harmony or unity, there are different tasks. But we're all moving in the same direction. And that's what God wants. That's when we're going to see a breakout of the things of God in our midst. So we have to be careful of the things we say because a loving family does not divide itself. Amen. If I'm the only person to say amen today, I'll say it. A loving family does not divide itself. It focuses on harmony. Amen. Let me move on. Because i got a couple more to cover. A loving family esteems each other. They regard one another. They hold, they hold high views and opinions of one another. We see great, we see, we see great value in one another. So if I consider you above me in terms of the honor and the esteem I give you, and you consider me above you, then there's a marvelous thing that will be happening in our midst. And we will have a community where everybody is looked up to and no one is looked down upon. What I'm talking about has nothing to do with what you what you do uh, in the secular in terms of your job. You can, be, you can be the president or CEO of a conglomerate. Another person can be a maid out there. But in here, we're one. My position or my standing in society has no bearing on what we're doing here. If I am wealthy and you are poor, I still regard you. My opinions of you are higher than of myself. Wow. Now when that happens, God moves. I don't look down upon you because of what I have. Or who I am in, out there in here, all washed in the blood of Jesus. I don't look down upon you because of who you are not, because in here you are everything. You may be, you may be my boss in the secular, but in here you're my brother, equal. Amen. And when we do that, we will see God moving. That's how a loving family operates. Also, a loving family looks out for each other with care. They, they have an interest in each other and their, their family. They have a pure interest in the affairs of the saints. That's how a loving family is supposed to function. So if we are coming up short today... We got to ask God for help to raise the limit. Amen. One more scripture. A couple more scriptures. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Reading from the NIV. Two, two, two things come out here. I also want to mention that a loving family does. It says bear with each other. And forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you.
Firstly, a loving family bears with one another. They're patient with, with each other. Even when the person has faults and they repeat their faults, there's a patience with one another. I'm beginning to hear some of you say, but this is hard. And I say, with God, all things are possible. A loving family forgives one another. Within this family, there should not be any one of us that is holding somebody in their heart. Amen. The Greek word for forgive comes from a term to cancel the debt of someone. To release them from the wrong they have done to you. In a family, in a natural family, someone will always do the other wrong. Because we're all growing together. We're all moving to that place of perfection. But in a natural family, when someone does the other wrong, there is forgiveness. And the next day you're speaking. In the church, it saddens the heart of God. Where someone can do another wrong, and that person holds, them, holds it against them for weeks, months, years, and ages. And they refuse to forgive them. But Apostle Paul says something very interesting. Forgive as Christ forgave you. We don't forgive as we want to. We forgive as Christ forgave us. And if we understand this, what Christ has forgiven us for is so much, there's nobody in the earth can do you as wrong as we did Christ. Seriously. And yet he forgave us. Come on, saints. Let them go to your heart. And forgive. As Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as, Christ, <coughs> just as in Christ God forgave you. So if Christ forgave you, there's nobody that we cannot forgive. Husband, forgive your wife. Wife, forgive your husband. Saints, forgive, forgive the saints. But what happens? Our love falls short in that we don't want to forgive. And instead of loving one another, people willfully hurt each other. People refuse to forgive one another. And I'm saying refuse. Because it's not the first time we preach on forgiveness. But yet people harden their hearts and don't want to forgive. Instead of loving people, not being not patient with one another. And then not speaking to one another. I don't understand that. That one I don't understand. The church is a loving family. So all of us will speak to one another. Amen. I want to tell you there's nothing that can't be forgiven. I really mean it. We should forgive one another. It doesn't matter how bad they hurt you. The love of God in you will want to forgive them. Let me talk just a minute about this. Not speaking to one another because I really don't understand it. So bear with me. The Bible says bear with one another. Bear with me because I don't fully Understand this, not speaking to one another. But then there's the other part of it. If somebody walks through the door and don't speak to you, what should your response be? Thank you. You don't know what's on their mind. You don't know what they left home. You don't know what they've been dealing with all week. You don't know what's preoccupying their mind. So if they pass you and don't speak to you, don't now run 
Oh, no, run uh, to Roger. She's passed me. My son does come. And she don't, you believe she don't speak to me? So here's what. If somebody walks past you and don't speak, hey, Bray, what's up? How are you doing? How come we don't do that? How come we like to love when people don't speak to us and we want to build a case, a case against them? We are one family. So call them back. How are you doing this morning? Is all well? But can you imagine? People allow people to pass them every Sunday. And nobody ever arrests a person. And you pass them, you don't speak to me. We good or not? Because we have also have a responsibility to our brother and sister. However, for those whose minds may be preoccupied, you also have a responsibility but when you come in the house of the Lord to realize it's not just you alone. <laughs> and that there are others here. So as occupied as your mind is, just remember, I may be passing someone. So I look around and I say hello. But then there may be the shy ones who may be afraid of people. Bear with them. Bring them in. Bring them into your circle. Bring them into your embrace. Amen. Oh, Lord, we're not getting many amens today, but. Oh, Jesus, let me finish this sermon. We're not getting a lot of amens because people comfortable. I ain't doing that all he taught. If you ain't speak to me, I ain't speaking to you. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Finally, the Bible also tells us how in, in certain ways, I love this one, how to demonstrate our love to one another. Four times, four times in the New Testament, we're told to greet one another with a holy kiss. Four times. An affectionate expression of love. It's a holy kiss. H-O-L-Y, not W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's a holy, sacred kiss. Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Corinthians 16, 20, greet one another with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 26, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. There it is, four times. Pure love can only be demonstrated with pure deeds. So if you have pure love, it will be a sacred kiss. And you have to be careful with this kissing thing, all right? I, I, I can't demonstrate with anyone else about my wife, so I want to ask her to come. Yeah. I can't do this with Alec Clifford because I'm kissing her. I'm going to use you as my demonstration today. All right. Pretend she's not my wife. You pretend. If we are greeting one another, especially male and female, do not throw yourself on the person. That was a little too dramatic. <laughs> you don't want to throw all yourself on the person. Make, make, it, make it sacred. Give some space 
for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm serious. You want to know what buddy had for breakfast this morning? So, I mean, be sacred in your greeting. And when a male is, is embracing a female or, or you're kissing, you want to put your mind person jaw no seriously you putting your mouth on the person's jaw for you got to be that close really really close and don't kiss with your mouth open either you don't want that seriously sacred sacred so you sacred just Side, side. You don't want all of this. No, sacred. No, I might be stretching this thing a bit, but sacred, holy kiss. And don't come behind and, oh Lord, this is out of bounds. Do not, as good as you know, I'll run behind them. And... No, boy, that's not sacred. And of course, their necks don't go there. What are you doing kissing somebody in the neck? <laughs> That's reserved. You get what I'm saying? I may be taking it from that, but I want you to understand the example. So you greet one another. God bless you, Sister Holford. Good to see you. And you have connected. Leave anything else for husband and wife. You get what I'm saying? That's why the word of God didn't say, greet one another with a kiss. Because then it will be left for all kinds of interpretations. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Gee, I'm getting some kisses this morning. <laughs> And be careful where your hands go. Leave it there on the shoulder. You don't want to greet one another <laughs> with any holy kiss. You get what I'm saying? This may be practical, but I see some stuff that you don't want happen. Keep it holy. Keep it sacred. Keep it pure. As much as you love the person, space for the wind and the Holy Spirit. Keep your jaw to a jaw, and we will be good. But we got to greet one another and embrace one another. Even when we tell each other, not just embrace one another, be good. We, I, I usually go out of sight. Bless you. Okay? And we keep it good. Thank you. So let's, let's close up. And we're going to take communion in a moment and we're going to celebrate a spirit of love. Pure love must be demonstrated with pure deeds. As a family, as a family, we must practice love. The Bible says that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. So the issue is not if we can love because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. As long as you're saved, the love of God, the agape love, has been poured out in your hearts. The issue is the activation of that which has been poured out in our hearts. And then the other issue is that we choose to love from our old selves. And not from the Spirit of God. Some of us may say, that's not me. I'm prepared to do all of that. I don't want anyone coming around me too close in my space. All this mushy, mushy stuff I am not in for. But this is how the Bible says we ought to live. Others may say, I'm Barbadian and our culture don't allow for that. And my response is, we are kingdom. And we, no matter where you are born, you are placed in the kingdom of God. 
and the kingdom culture must be paramount to national culture. 1 John 4, 19, and it says, and then to verse 21, we love because he first loved us. Whosoever claimed to love God, yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar. For what? For whoever does not love his brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this commandment. Anyone who loves God must also love his brother and sister. That's the word. So God has designed so that God has so designed that the demonstration of our love for him is seen in our love for one another. I want to say it again because that's loaded. God has so designed that our demonstration of love for him is seen in our demonstration of love for one another. As you love God, you love one another. As you love one another, you love God. I believe that with all my heart. I believe if we can truly love and care for each other and be united as one body, that we will see a release of God's glory and power in our midst like never before. We are moving into some new territory as a church starting today. We're moving a new territory of display of love and affection and care for one another starting today. Because my intent as your, as your pastor is to restructure this ministry as a place where love and care and honor and harmony flow. Where we are united in one purpose. We just cannot be a bunch of people that come to church, sing songs, hear a sermon and go home. That's not what I see in the scriptures. And we will make the effort and we will do this together. I see it happening in the books, book of Acts and I see it happening in New Dimensions. So we will recapture our former days. I believe that as a body of believers, how we were 15 years ago, we should be greater and better and further now. I believe that. So my, my purpose in God, if it needs be, is to restructure us and do different things in our services. That's why we also have the care groups, the place where we can demonstrate our affection one for another in doing kind deeds. And then people will say, I don't want to deal with care groups. I got better things to do. But then you have to demonstrate that love and care one for another. So I believe what, what, what happened in the book, book of Acts can happen here in our midst. Acts chapter 32, Acts chapter 4, verse 32 and 33. And I, fin I end with this. Now the multitude of believers were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And here's the result of it. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. My prayer is that this happens among us too. But when we function as one, and when we love one another, and we show care and, and compassion and affection for one another. There will be an increase in the power of God. There will be an increase in miracles. There will be an increase in the glory of God. There will be an increase in the witness for Jesus. And more so, there will be an increase in the grace of God upon us. Let us stand together. Amen. Amen. Come worship team.